Good morning. It's January 2024, and in, in the year of 2023, I spent some time trying to memorize the book of Daniel from the Old Testament. I used the complete Jewish Bible as my text and tried to insert some of the words from the Orthodox Jewish Bible um, in Aramaic and Hebrew. Disclaimer, my pronunciation will probably be all wrong. And then I also took some names of God. Um, there's a version called Names of God. And I went through and I, I inserted those in too because I thought that was very interesting. And um, I think this will give a richer feel. I encourage everyone to pick up the habit of Bible memorization. It's commanded in God's Word. And it is really psychologically practical, spiritually edifying, uh, good for your health, everything. Especially when you do it when you're out walking. And that brings me to my other point before I get started, and that is I record this while I'm out walking so that you can see I'm not using a script or any kind of paper or whatever. But I don't do it so you can see my face because I really don't like showing that off, especially since I just woke up. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So here we go with the book of Daniel. Daniel, chapter one. In the third year of the reign, of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And Adonai gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the house of God. He took them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the articles in the storehouse of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the eunuch serving as chief officer, to bring into the palace from the people of Judah, some of royal or noble descent. They were to be boys without physical defect, handsome in appearance, well versed in all kinds of wisdom and understanding, quick to learn, and having the capacity to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Kazdim or Chaldeans, and they were to be cared for in this way for three years, oh no, the king assigned them a daily portion of his own food and the wine he drank, and they were to be cared for in this way for three years, and after that time they were to become the king's attendants. Among those chosen from the people of Israel were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief officer gave them other names. To Daniel he gave the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the king's food and the wine he drank. So he asked the chief officer for permission to be excused from defiling himself. And Adonai caused the chief officer to be kind and sympathetic to Daniel. But he said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king. After all, he has assigned you a daily portion of his own food and the wine he drinks. If he were to see you boys looking worse than the others your age, you would be putting my head in danger from the king. So Daniel spoke to the guard in charge of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and he said, Please, try and experiment on your servants. For ten days, give us only vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then see how we look. And compare us with how those boys who eat the king's food look and deal with your servants according to what you see. So the guard agreed to do what he had asked, they had asked, and gave them a ten-day test. At the end of the ten days, they looked better and more robust than all the boys who were eating the king's food looked. So the guard took away their food and the wine they were supposed to drink and gave them only vegetables instead. Now to these four boys, Elohim, is it Elohim or Adonai, had given knowledge and skill and every aspect of learning and understanding. Moreover, Daniel could understand all kinds of dreams and visions. When the time the king had set for them to be presented came, the chief officer brought them before Nebuchadnezzar, the king. 
And when the king spoke with them, none could be found among them to compare with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service, and in all matters requiring wisdom and understanding, whenever the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the sages and exorcists in the entire kingdom. Hey, this is Daniel chapter 2. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, Nebuchadnezzar became so troubled by a series of dreams that he had that he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, exorcists, astrologers, and diviners. No, no. The magicians, exorcists, sorcerers, and astrologers uh -huh, to be summoned so that they could interpret the king's dream. So they, when the sages of Babel came, that's wrong, King Nebuchadnezzar said, I have had a dream that will keep troubling my spirit until I know what it means. So the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, and Aramaic starts here. May the king live forever. Let his majesty tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. But Nebuchadnezzar answered, This is what I have firmly decided. Unless you tell me both the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your house is reduced to rubble. <laughs> but if you do tell me the dream and its interpretation, you will receive presents, rewards, and great honor. Now, just tell me the dream. That... And its interpretation. Oh yeah, that's... Uh -huh. A second time they answered the king. Let his majesty tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it for you. Then the king said, I can see that you are trying to gain time because you can see that I have decided that if you don't tell me both the dream and its interpretation, there is but one sentence passed on all of you. So you have conspired to mislead me with lies in the hope that time will change things. Now, just tell me the dream. That will convince me that you are also able to give me its correct interpretation. Then the astrologers answered, Your Majesty, no one in the whole world can do this. Never has any king, no matter how great or powerful, asked this of any magician, exorcist, astrologer, or diviner. The king is asking an impossible thing. Nobody but the gods can tell his majesty the secret he has asked about, and they do not live among mere mortals. Then the king flew into a rage and ordered all the sages of Babel to be put to death. When the decree was published for the sages of Babel to be slain, they sought Daniel and his companions to have them put to death. Then, choosing his words carefully, Daniel consulted Ariok, captain of the royal guard, who had already gone out to slay the sages of, uh, to kill the other sages of Babel. Slay, kill. Hmm. He said to Ariok, Since you are the king's official, let me ask, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? Ariok explained the matter to Daniel, so Daniel went in and asked the king to give him more time to give the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went home and made the matter known to Shad uh, no to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, so that they might ask the Allah of heaven for mercy regarding this secret. Thus saved Daniel and his companions from dying along with the other sages of Babel. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision at night, and Daniel blessed the Allah of heaven with these words. Blessed be Eloah, from eternity past to eternity future. I think it's blessed be the name of Eloah, from eternity past to eternity future. Wisdom and power alone are his. He changes, he brings changes to the seasons and times. He installs and deposes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those with discernment. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I praise and thank you, Allah of my ancestors, for giving me wisdom and power, for making known 
to me what we wanted from you, for making known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to see Ariok, who had already gone out to slay the sages, uh, to destroy the sages of Babel. And he said, Do not destroy the sages of Babel. Bring them before the king, and I will give him the interpretation. Quickly, Ariok brought Daniel before the king and said, I have found one of the exiles of Judah who will reveal the interpretation to his majesty. Then King Nebuchadnezzar said to Daniel, who had been renamed Belshazzar, Can you tell me both the dream and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king, No sage exorcist sorcerer or astrologer can tell the king this mystery he has asked about, but there is an Allah in heaven who unlocks secrets, and he has revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the archer at Haman, which means days to come. Here are your dream and visions you had in your head while you were on your bed. Your majesty, while you were in bed, you begin to think about what would take place in the future. And he who reveals secrets has revealed to you what will take place. But this secret has not been revealed to me because I'm wiser than anyone living, but so that the meaning may be made known to your majesty and so that you might understand the thoughts of your own mind. Your majesty had a vision of a statue, very large and extremely bright. It stood in front of you and its appearance was terrifying. The head of the statue was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its trunk and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron, partly of clay. As you watched, a stone separated itself without human hands and struck the statue on its feet, partly of iron, partly of clay, and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in summer, and the wind blew them all away without leaving a trace. Then the stone grew and became a mountain that filled the whole earth. That is what you dreamed, Your Majesty, and now we will give you its interpretation. Your Majesty, King of Kings, to whom the Allah of Heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. So wherever people, wild animals, and birds of the air live, he has given them into your hands and enabled you to rule them all. You are that head of gold. But after you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Then a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule the whole world. Then a fourth kingdom of iron. Iron can break anything to pieces pulverize it and crush it. So just as iron can crush anything, this kingdom will break the other kingdoms to pieces, pulverize it and crush it. Finally, you saw the toes of the feet, partly of iron, partly of clay. This will be a divided kingdom, but it will still have some of the firmness of iron in it, since you saw the iron mixed with clay. Just as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. You saw the toes of the feet, partly of iron, partly of baked clay. This means that they will cement their alliances by intermarriages, but they will not stick together any more than iron blends with baked clay. In the days of those kings, the great Allah of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed. This kingdom will not pass into the hands of another people. Instead, it will break and consume all those other kingdoms, but it itself will stand forever like the stone you saw, which without human hands separated itself and became a mountain that filled the whole earth. Like the stone you saw, which without human hands broke to pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great Allah of heaven has revealed to you 
what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is reliable. Then Nebuchadnezzar fell down and worshiped Daniel. He ordered that a grain offering and incense be offered to Daniel and to Daniel the king said, surely your Elah is the Elah of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets because you have been able to reveal this secret. Then Nebuchadnezzar promoted Daniel to a higher rank and gave him many rich gifts. He made him governor over the provinces of Babel and head over the sages of Babel. At Daniel's request, the king put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in charge over the affairs of the province of Babel. But Daniel remained in attendance on the king. Okay, this is Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king had a gold statue made, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. That is 30 meters high and three meters wide. There's also cubit measurements, you can look those up. And he set it up on the plain of Dora in the province of Babel. Then the king ordered all the viceroys, prefects, governors, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, and all the provincial officials to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. I think it says gold statue. So, all the viceroys, prefects, governors, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, and all the provincial officials came to the dedication of the statue which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood in front of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And a herald pro proclaimed, People and nations and languages, you are ordered that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, harp, zither, lute, bagpipe, and the rest of the musical instruments, you are to fall down and worship the gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Anyone who does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing, immediately into the blazing hot furnace. So, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, harp, zither, lute, and the rest of the musical instruments, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold statue which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. But then some Khazdim, or Chaldeans, or sorcerers, approached and began denouncing the Jews. They said, May the king live forever. They said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, May the king live forever. Your majesty, you have ordered that everyone who, anyone, everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, harps, the lute, bagpipe, and the rest of the musical instruments is to fall down and worship the gold statue that you set up. But there are some Jews whom you have put in charge over the affairs of the province of Babel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, your majesty, have paid no attention to you. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the gold statue that you set up. In a raging fury, Nebuchadnezzar ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they were brought into the king's presence, and the king said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, is it true that you neither worship? You neither serve my gods nor worship the gold statue that I set up? Very well. Now, if you are prepared, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, harp, zither, lute, bagpipe, and the rest of the musical instruments, to fall down and worship, oh, very well. But if you will not fall down and worship, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing hot furnace. And what God will save you from my power then? Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, Your question does not require an answer from us, your majesty. If our Elah, whom we serve, is able to save us, he will save us from the blazing hot furnace and from your power. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know that we will neither serve your gods nor worship the gold statue that you set up. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar became so utterly enraged that his face was distorted with anger toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual, and he ordered some of the strongest men in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing hot furnace. So these men were tied up in their robes, tunics, cloaks, and other clothes and thrown into the blazing hot furnace. The king's order was so urgent and the furnace so overheated that the men carrying Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were burned to death by the flames. So these men fell bound into the blazing hot furnace. Suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar sprang to his feet. Alarmed, he asked his advisors, Didn't we throw three men bound into the flames? His advisor answered, uh, Yes, of course, your majesty. But King Nebuchadnezzar said, Well, look, I see four men, not tied up, walking around there in the flames unhurt. And the fourth looks like one of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar approached the opening to the blazing hot furnace and called out, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you servants of El Elon, come out and come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego emerged from the flames. All the viceroys, prefects, and royal advisors who, was there, who were there saw that the fire had had no power over the bodies of these men. Not even their hair was singed. Their clothes looked the same, and they did not smell of fire. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God, the El of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to deliver his servants who trusted in him. They defied the royal order to the point of being willing to give up their bodies in order not to serve or worship any god but their own Elah. Therefore, I herewith decree that anyone who says anything to insult the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego should be um, torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to rubble, for there is no other god who can save like this. So the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to a higher rank in the province of Babel. The following letter was sent out to all the peoples, nations, and... Oh, no, wait, he starts with himself. <laughs> From Nebuchadnezzar the king to all the peoples, nations, and languages living throughout the earth. Shalom, Rav. Abundant peace. I am pleased to recount the signs and wonders which the God Most High has done for me. How great are his signs! How awesome his wonders! His kingdom lasts forever, and he rules all generations. This is Daniel chapter 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was contentedly living at home, enjoying the luxury of my palace, when I had a dream that frightened me followed by fantasies and visions in my head that frightened me even more. So I ordered all the sages of Babel to present themselves to me, so that they could interpret the dream for me. But though... I think it's... I don't know if it's just sages there, or if it's magicians, exorcists, astrologers, magicians, exorcists, sorcerers, and... Hmm... I don't know. So when the sages of Babel came in, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel, renamed Belshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, came before me, and I told him the dream. I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the meaning of the vision I had in my head. Here are the visions I had in my head while I was on my bed. I looked, and there before me was a tree, 
the center of the earth. It was very tall. The tree grew and became strong until its crown reached the sky and it could be seen from anywhere on earth. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit was very abundant, enough to feed everyone. The wild animals enjoyed its shade and the birds of the air took rest in its branches and it provided enough food for every living creature. I looked in the vision of my head as I lay on my bed and there appeared a holy watcher coming down from heaven who cried out, cut down the tree and cut off its branches and strip off its leaves and let its fruit be scattered. Let the wild animals flee from its shelter and let the birds of the air abandon its branches. Believe it stumped with its roots in the ground with a band of iron and bronze and the lush grass of the countryside. Let his body be drenched with dew from the sky and share the lot with his lot with animals in the pasture. Let his heart and mind cease to be human and become like that of an animal. This is the order issued by the watchers and announced by the holy ones so that everyone may know that El Elah rules in the human kingdom, gives it to whomever he wishes and can raise up over it the lowliest of mortals. That is what I dreamt. I, Nebuchadnezzar, dreamt. Now you, Belshazzar, tell me the meaning of the mystery I had in my head. Uh, the meaning of the vision I had in my head. None of the sages of my kingdom can do it, but you can do it, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, renamed Belshazzar, was in shock for a while, frightened by his thoughts. But the king said to Belshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation frighten you. But Belshazzar answered the king, my lord, if only the dream was about your enemies and its interpretation about those who hate you. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong until its crown reached the sky and it could be seen from anywhere on earth, whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit very abundant, enough to feed everyone, and under whom the, under which the wild animals lived and on whose branches the birds of the air built their nest. It's you, your majesty. You have grown and become strong and your greatness has grown and reaches to the heaven and your rule extends to the ends of the earth. Now the king saw a holy watcher coming down from heaven who cried out, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump with the roots in the ground and a band of iron and bronze and lush grass of the countryside. Let his body be drenched with dew from the sky as seven seasons pass over him. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and... It is the decree of the God Most High, the El Elah, that has come upon my Lord the King. You will be driven from human society to live with the wild animals. You will be fed grass like an ox. And your body will be drenched with dew from the sky as seven seasons pass over you. But since it was ordered to leave its stump with its roots in the ground, your kingdom will be kept for you until you learn that Ella Ella rules in the human kingdom and gives it to whomever he wishes. Now, your majesty, take my advice. Break with your sins by replacing them with acts of charity and break with your crimes by showing mercy to the poor. This may extend the time of your prosperity. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king Twelve months later, as he was walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babel, the king said, Nebuchadnezzar said, Babel the Great, I built it as a royal residence by my power and force to enhance the glory of my majesty. No sooner had the king spoken these words than a voice came down from heaven and said, King Nebuchadnezzar, these words are for you. The kingdom has left you. You will be driven from human society to live with the wild animals. You will be fed grass like an ox, and your body will be drenched with dew from the sky as seven seasons pass over you.
until you learn that El Elah rules in the human kingdom and gives it to whomever he wishes. Within an hour, the word was fulfilled, and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. To live with the wild animals, he was fed grass like an ox, and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair had grown like eagle feathers and his nails like bird claws. At the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes toward heaven and my understanding came back to me. I blessed the Elah of heaven and I praised and gave honor to him who lives forever, for he is the living God. His kingdom lasts forever and he rules all generations. No one on the earth Oh, those who live on the earth are counted as nothing. He does what he wishes with the armies of heaven and with those living on earth. No one can hold back his power or ask him, what are you doing? It was at that moment that my understanding came back to me. And for the sake of the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and my splendor also came back to me. My advisors and lords sought me out, and I was re-established in my kingdom. To my previous greatness, even more was added. Now I praise the God of heaven, for all his words are true, all his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar the king gave a gold banquet for a thousand of his lords, and in the presence of the thousand the king was drinking wine. While tasting the, the wine, or some translations say, under the influence of the wine, Belshazzar ordered that the gold and silver vessels, which had been taken from the temple in Yerushalayim, be brought so that the king, his lords, his wives, and his concubines could drink wine from them. So they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the sanctuary of Elohim in Yerushalayim. Oh, no, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had taken from the sanctuary in Yerushalayim. And the king, his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank wine from them. They drank their wine and praised their gods made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand began a, appeared and began writing on the plaster of the palace wall by the lampstands. When the king saw the palm of the hand that was writing, his face took a different look. It also can be translated, he sobered up. As frightening thoughts rose up in him, his hip joints gave way, and his knees began knocking together. The king cried out for the sages of Babel, for, uh, for the magicians, exorcists, and diviners to be brought so that they could read the inscription and tell him what it meant. The, to the sages of Babel, the king said, whoever can read this inscription and tell me what it means will be dressed in raw purple, wear a gold chain around their neck, and be one of the three men ruling the kingdom. But though the sages of Babel came in, none could read the inscription or tell him what it meant. So the king's face turned pale, and his lords were thrown into confusion. At that point, the queen mother, because, because of what the king and his lords were saying, entered the banquet hall. She said, may the king live forever. Don't let your thoughts frighten you, and don't let your face be so pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, he was found to have light, discernment, and extraordinary wisdom. Nebuchadnezzar the king, your father, the king, your father, made him chief over the magicians, exorcists, astrologers, and diviners, because he was found to have extraordinary spirit, knowledge, discernment, and the ability to give interpretations 
unlock mysteries, give interpretations, and solve naughty problems. He is called Daniel, but the king gave him the name Belshazzar. Now, have Daniel summoned, and he will tell you what this means. So Daniel was brought into the king's presence. And to Daniel, the king said, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles of Yuda, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king my father, brought out of the land of Yuda? I've heard about you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Now, the sages, the exorcists were brought in so that they could read this inscription and tell me what it means, but they could not interpret it for me. Now, but I've heard that you can give inscription, you can give interpretation and solve naughty problems. Now, if you can read this inscription and tell me what it means, you will be dressed in raw purple, wear a gold chain around your neck, and be one of the three men ruling the kingdom. Daniel answered the king, you can keep your gifts and give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read this inscription and tell the king what it means. Your Majesty, the Allah of heaven gave King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the kingdom, the power, strength, and the glory. So wherever people, uh, no matter from what, uh, so people, yes, yes, yes. So people, no matter from which, uh, your majesty, the Allah of heaven gave Nebuchadnezzar your father the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. So everyone, no matter from which people, nation, or language, trembled in fear before him. Anyone he wanted to, he put to death. Anyone he wanted to, he kept alive. Anyone he wanted to, he advanced. And anyone he wanted to, he humbled. But when the king grew strong, his, and his spirit became hard, he began treating people arrogantly, so that the king was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from human society. His heart was made like that of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys, and he was fed grass like an ox, and his body was drenched with dew from the sky. A seven seasons passed over him until he learned that El Elal rules in the human kingdom and gives it to whomever he wishes. But Belshazzar, you, his son, though you knew all this, have not humbled your heart. Instead, you have exalted yourself against the Elah of heaven by having them bring you the vessels from his house so that you and your lords and your wives and your concubines could drink wine from them. You drank your wine and praised your gods made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see, hear, or know anything. Meanwhile, the Elah of heaven, who holds your very breath in his hands and to whom belongs everything you do, you have not glorified. That is why. He has sent the hand to write this inscription. And this is what the inscription says. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Ufarsin. And this is what the inscription means. Mene, Allah has counted up your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance scale and, found, and come up short. Parsin, your kingdom is parsed out to the Medes and Persians. Then the king gave the order, and they clothed Daniel in royal purple, put a gold chain around his neck, and proclaimed that he was to be one of the three men ruling the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Kazdim, was killed. The kingdom passed to Dariavesh the Mede when he was about 62 years old. Dariavesh decided to set over the kingdom 120 viceroys to rule throughout the entire kingdom, with three chiefs over them. 
of whom Daniel was one. So that these viceroys might be responsible to those chiefs and so that the king's interests could be safeguarded. But because an extraordinary spirit was in this Daniel, he so distinguished himself above the other priests and viceroys chiefs and viceroys that the king considered putting him in charge of the entire kingdom. The other chiefs and viceroys tried to find a cause for complaint against this Daniel in regard to how he performed his governing duties, but they could find nothing to complain about, no fault. On the contrary, because Daniel was so faithful, not even a single instance of negligence or faulty administration could be found. So these men said, we are not going to find any cause for complaint against this Daniel unless we find something to complain about in regard to the law of his God. So these men descended on the king and said, King Dariavesh, live forever. All the chiefs and viceroys and royal advisors have met and agreed that the king should issue a decree putting in force the following, whoever makes a request of any god or man over the next 30 days, except of you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion's den. Now, issue this decree over your signature so that it cannot be changed, as required by the law of the Medes and Persians, which is itself irrevocable. So, the king signed the document, and the decree became law. On learning that the document had been signed, Daniel went home. Now the windows of his upstairs room were open in the direction of Jerusalem, and there he kneeled down and prayed, giving thanks before his Allah, just as he had been doing before. So these men descended on Daniel and found him pleading before his Allah, and making, uh, making requests and pleading before his Allah. So these men went to the king and reminded him of his royal decree. Didn't you sign a law prohibiting anyone from making a request of any god or man over the next 30 days except you, your majesty? Oh yes, that is true, as required by the law of the Medes and Persians, which is itself irrevocable. So they said, well that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, respects neither you, your majesty, nor the decree you signed. Instead, he continues praying three times a day. When the king heard this report, he was very upset, and he determined to save Daniel, and he worked until sunset to rescue him. But these men descended on the king and said, Remember, your majesty, that it is a... That Remember, your majesty, that no decree or edict once issued by the king can be revoked. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. King Derivish said to Daniel, Your God, whom you are always serving, will save you. A stone was brought to block the opening of the pit, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lord's so that nothing regarding Daniel could be changed. Or so they thought. <laughs> then the king returned to the palace and spent the night fasting, refusing to be entertained as sleep eluded him. Very early in the morning, the king got up and hurried to the lion pit. On approaching the pit where Daniel was, the king cried out in a pained voice, Daniel, servant of El Elon, has your God whom you are always serving, been able to save you? Daniel answered the king, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth. That is because before him I was found innocent, and I have caused you no harm, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be taken up from the pit. So Daniel was taken up from the pit, and... He was found to be completely unharmed because he had trusted in his Allah. So the king gave the order and brought those men who had accused Daniel and threw them into the lion pit. 
them, their children, and their wives. And before they even reached the bottom of the pit, the lions had them in their control and broke all their bones to pieces. King Dariavesh wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages living throughout the earth, Shalom Rav, abundant peace. I herewith decree that everywhere in my kingdom, people are to tremble and be in awe of the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom, uh, his rulership extends throughout all generations. I, I might have messed up. He... saves, he rescues, he does signs and wonders both in heaven and on earth. And he delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Dariavesh, the Mede, and also during the reign of Koresh, the Persian. Okay, this is Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babel, Daniel had a dream and visions in his head as he was lying on his bed. Daniel wrote the dream down, and this is his account. I looked, and there before me I saw the four winds of the sky breaking over the great sea, and four huge animals coming up out of the great sea, each different from the others. The first was like a lion, but it had eagle's wings. I watched as his wings were plucked off, and it was lifted off the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human heart was given it. Then I looked, and there was another one, a second animal, like a bear. It raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and gorge yourself on flesh. Then I looked, and there before me was a third animal like a leopard, with four bird's wings on its side. This animal also had four heads, and it was given power to rule. Then I looked in the night visions. After this, I looked in the night visions, and there before me was a fourth animal, dreadful, horrible, and extremely strong, with great teeth. It was different than all the animals. Wait, wait. It devoured, crushed, and stamped its feet on what was left. It was different from all the animals that had gone before it, and it had ten horns. As I was considering the horns, another horn sprang up from among them, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. In this horn were eyes like human eyes, and a mouth speaking arrogantly. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days, Atik Yoman, came and took his seat. His appearance was like lightning. The hair on his head was like pure wool. His eyes were like fiery torches, like wheels of, oh no, and his throne was a fiery flame, like wheels of burning fire. A stream of fire flowed from his presence. Thousands and thousands ministered to him. Millions and millions stood before him. Then the court was convened and the books were open. And because of the arrogant words the little horn was speaking, I watched as the animal was killed, its body destroyed, and it was given over to be burned completely. As for the other three animals, their rulership was taken away from them, but their lives were pro prolonged for a time and a season. I kept watching in the night vision, and as I watched, I saw coming on the clouds of heaven, one like a bar Enosh, son of man. He approached Atik Yoman and was led into his presence. To him was given rulership, glory, and a kingdom, so that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His rulership is an everlasting rulership. And his kingdom is one that will last forever. Okay. 
As for me, Daniel, my spirit deep within me was troubled, and the visions in my head terrified me so much that I approached one standing by and asked him what all this meant. He said he would make thee able to understand the vision. The four animals are the four kingdoms that will rise on the earth. But the holy people of El Yonin, the Am Kidoshim of El Yonin, will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. Yes, forever and ever. But I wanted to know what the fourth beast meant, the one that was different from all the others, so terrifying, with iron teeth and bronze nails. The one that devoured, crushed, and stamped his feet on what was left and was different from all the others that had gone before it, and what the ten horns on its head meant, and about the little horn, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, before which three of the first horns fell. This horn with eyes like human eyes and a mouth speaking arrogantly and seemed greater than all the others. I watched as this little horn made war on the Amkidoshim of El Yonin and was winning until the Atik Yoman came and judgment was given in favor of the Amkidoshim of El Yonin and the time came for them to take over the kingdom. This is what he said. The fourth animal is the fourth kingdom that will rise on the earth. It will be different from the other animals that have gone before it. It will devour, crush, and stamp its feet on what is left. No, no. It will devour the whole earth, trample it down, and crush it. As for the ten horns, and the other horn, Oh no, as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will rise, and yet another will rise after them. He will put down three kings. He will speak against El, Elah, and try to exhaust the holy people of El, Yonin. He will attempt to alter the seasons and the laws. Then the holy people of El Yonin will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. But when the court goes into session, he will be stripped of his rulership, which will be consumed and destroyed. Then the holy people of El Yonin, then the kingdom, the greatness, and the rulership of all kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the Amkidoshim of El Yonin. Their kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will serve and obey them. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts frightened me so much that my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. <clears throat> this is Daniel chapter eight. <clears throat> After that vision, it was the third year of the reign of Belshazzar that another vision appeared to me, Daniel. I looked into the vision, and as I looked, I found myself in Shushan, the capital city in the province of Yalem. I looked into the vision, and as I looked, I was by the Ulai Canal. I looked up, and as I watched, I saw there in front of the ra the stream a ram with two horns. The horns were long, but one was longer than the other, and the longer one sprang up later. I watched as the ram pushed west, north and south. No animal could stand up against it, <clears throat> nor was there any one who could rescue from its power. So the ram did as it pleased, and it became very strong. I was beginning to understand when a male goat came from the west, passing over the whole earth without touching the ground. This goat had a prominent horn between its eyes. It approached the ram, which I had seen standing by the river, 
and charged it with savage force. The male goat advanced on the ram, filled with rage against it, and struck the ram, breaking off its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it, so the male goat threw the ram to the ground and trampled it down. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from the male goat's power. So the male goat became extremely strong. But when it was strong, its big horn was broken off, and in its place arose four horns, what appeared to be four horns, in the direction of the four winds, and in the direction of the glory. Aret, I think it's Aretz Tezevi. That's the Aramaic or Hebrew word, I'm not sure. Anyway. It became so great that it even reached the Tsuva Hashomayim, armies of heaven. It threw some of the, it hurled some of the Tsuva and stars, Kokovim, to the ground and trampled them down. Yes, it even considered itself as great as the prince of the armies of heaven, the Sar Ha Tsuava so that the regular burnt offering, the Ha Tamid, was taken away from the Sar Ha Tsava, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown to the ground. Through sin, the army was put under his power, along with the Ha Tamid. He flung truth, Emmys, to the ground as he acted and prospered. Then I heard one Kadosh speaking, and another Kadosh said to the speaker, how long will the events of this vision last? <clears throat> the vision that is so appalling that the Kodesh and the Tsuva are trampled underfoot. The first said to me, 2,300 evenings and mornings, after which the Kodesh will be restored to its rightful state. After I had seen this vision and was trying to understand it, suddenly there stood in front of me someone who looked like a human being, and I heard a human voice calling from between the banks of the Ulai, Gavriel, make this man able to understand the vision. Gavriel came up to where I was standing, and his approach so terrified me that I fell with my face to the ground. But he said, human being, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. As he was speaking to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face toward the ground. <clears throat> but then he touched me and set me on my feet and said, I have come now, Daniel, to tell you what will happen at the end of the period of fury, for the vision has to do with the time of the end. You saw a ram with two horns. These are the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy male goat is the kingdom of Greece, and the prominent horn between its eye is the first king. As for that horn that broke, the other four which arose in its place, out of this kingdom four kings will rise, yet not with the power the first king had. In the latter part of their reign, when evildoers have become as evil as possible, there will arise an arrogant king, skilled in intrigue. He will be great, but not by his own power. He will be amazingly destructive. He will destroy uh, and succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty and holy ones. He will succeed through craftiness and deceit. He will destroy many people just when they feel secure. Yes, he will even consider himself as great as the prince of princes, the Tsar Tsarim. But without human intervention, he will be broken. The vision of the 2,300 evenings and mornings, which has been told you, is true. But you are to keep it a secret, for the vision has to do with the time of the end. As for me, Daniel, I grew weak and was ill for some days. But then I got up and took care of the king's affairs. But I kept the mad... But I was appalled at the vision and still did not understand it. This is Daniel chapter 9.
In the first year of the reign of Dariavesh, son of Ashashverosh, a Mede by birth who is made king over the kingdom of the Kazdim, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, was reading the scriptures and thinking about the number of years that Yahweh had told Jeremiah the prophet would be the period of Yerushalayim's desolation, 70 years. I turned to Adonai Elohim to seek an answer, pleading with him in prayer with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to Adonai my Elohim and made this confession. Please, Adonai, great and fearsome Elohim, who keeps his covenant and extends his grace to those who love him and keep his mitzvot, or laws. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly. We have not listened to the voice of your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our leaders, our ancestors, and all the people of the land. To you, Adonai, belongs righteousness, but to us, belong shame to us the men of Judah the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel including both those living nearby and far away in the countries you have driven us them because they broke faith with you yes Adonai shame has fallen on us our kings our leaders and our ancestors because we rebelled against you it is to Hashem, Adonai, our Elohim, to show compassion and forgiveness because we have sinned against you. We did not listen to the voice of Yahweh, our Elohim, so that we might live by his mitzvot, which he presented to us, through his Eved servants. Yes, Adonai, all Israel flouted your Torah and turned away, unwilling to listen to your voice. Therefore, the curses and the oath written in the Torah of Moshe, the servant of Ha Elohim, have been poured on out, out on us. Because we rebelled against you, you carried out the threats you spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing this disaster on us. This disaster so great that under the whole heavens, nothing has been done like what has been done to Yerushalayim. As written in the Torah of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not appeased Yahweh our Elohim by renouncing our wrongdoing and discerning your truth. So Yahweh watched for the right moment to bring this disaster on us. For Yahweh our Elohim was just in everything he did, yet we didn't listen when he spoke. Now Adonai, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, thus winning renown for yourself today, renowned for yourself, as is the case today. We have sinned and acted wickedly, but Adonai, in keeping with your justice, let your anger and fury be turned away from your people and your Har Kodesh, holy mountain. For it is due to our sin and the sin of our ancestors that your people and your city have become, that Jerusalem and your people have become objects of scorn to everyone around us. Now Adonai, no, now Elohim, listen to the prayer and pleadings of your Eved, your servant, and cause your face to shine on your desolate Mikdash sanctuary for your own sake. <clears throat> Adonai, open your ears and hear, I think it's, turn your ears and hear, open your eyes and see how desolate we are, as well as the city that bears your name. For we plead with you, not because of our own righteousness, but because of your compassion. Adonai, hear. Adonai, forgive. Adonai, pay attention and do not delay action. <clears throat> For your own sake, my Elehoya. 
for your people and your city bear your name. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and pleading before Elohim for the holy mountain, the Har Kodesh of my Elohim, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, Gavriel, whom I had seen in the vision, or Chazon, at the beginning, swooped down on me in full flight about the time of the evening sacrifice and explained things to me. He said, I have come now, Daniel, to enable you to understand the vision clearly. From the beginning of your prayers, an answer was given, and I have come to tell you that it is because you are greatly loved. Now look into this answer and understand the vision. Seventy weeks of years are decreed for your people and your city for putting an end to the transgression, for making an end of sin, for forgiving iniquity, for bringing in everlasting justice, for putting a seal on the vision and prophets, and for anointing the holiest of holies, the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Know, <clears throat> therefore, and discern that seven weeks of years will elapse between the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Yerushalayim until an anointed prince comes, Moshiach Nagid. It will remain built for 62 weeks of years with open spaces and moats, but these will be troubled times. At the end of the 62 weeks, Moshiach will be cut off, but not for himself. Then the people of the prince yet to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. But his end will come like a flood, and desolations are decreed until the war is over. He will make a strong covenant with leaders for one week of years. In the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offerings on the wings of detestable things. A desolator will come and continue until the already decreed destruction is poured out on the dust. Daniel chapter 10. In the third year of the reign of Koresh, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, also called Belshazzar, and the word was certain, a great war. Daniel understood the word, having gained understanding from the Chazon. At that time, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three whole weeks. I ate no food that satisfied me, no meat or wine entered my mouth, and I did not anoint myself until three full weeks had passed. On the 24th day of the first month, I, Daniel, was on the banks of the great river, the Tigris, when I looked up, and there before me I saw a man dressed in linen, wearing a belt of fine ufas gold. His body was like barrel. His face was like lightning, his eyes like fiery torches, his hands and feet were the color of burnished bronze. And when he spoke, it sounded like the roar of a crowd. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The other men who were with me did not see the vision, but such a trembling fell on them that they rushed to hide themselves. Thus I was left alone, and when I saw this great vision, there was no strength or coat left in me. <clears throat> My face, normally pleasant looking, turned pale, and I had no coat or strength. Then I heard his voice speaking, and when I heard him speaking, I fell down in a faint with my face toward the ground. But a hand touched me and set me tottering on my hands and knees and said, Daniel, you are a man who is greatly loved. Now pay attention to the words I am saying to you and stand up for upright, for it is to you I have been sent now. After he said this to me, I stood up trembling and he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. For from the first day you determined to understand and humble yourself before your Elohim, an answer was given, and I have come because of what you said. 
the prince of the kingdom of Persia, prevented me from coming for 21 days. But Mikhail, one of the chief princes, came to assist me so that I was no longer needed in Persia. And now I have come to make known to you what will happen to your people in the archer at Haman days to come. For there is still another vision which will relate to those days. <clears throat> <clears throat> After he said this to me, I looked down to the ground and could not speak. But then someone who looked like a human being touched my lips so that I could open my mouth and speak. And I said, My Lord, it is because of the chazon that I am seized with such anguish and I have no strength. For how can the servant of my Lord speak with my Lord when my strength and breath have failed me? Then again, someone who looked human touched me and revived me. And he said, you man so greatly loved, don't be afraid. Shalom to you and be strong. Yes, truly strong. Then I said, my Lord, keep speaking for you have given me strength. Then he said to me, do you know why I have come to you? Though soon I will have to return to fight the Prince of Persia, and when I leave, the Prince of Greece will come. Nevertheless, I have come to tell you what is written <clears throat> in the Book of Truth. There is no one who stands up against them with me, except Michael, your prince. This is Daniel chapter 11. But I was already standing up to support and help Dariavesh in the first year of his reign. What I'm going to tell you is true. Three kings will arise in Persia, followed by a fourth who will be far wealthier than all of them. When he has grown strong by means of his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a Gibor Melech, powerful king, will appear, who will rule a vast kingdom and do whatever he pleases. But once he appears, his kingdom will be broken up and divided to the four winds of heaven. It won't be inherited by his ancestors, and it won't be ruled. Um, it won't be inherited by his descendants, and it won't be ruled with the power he had, <clears throat> because his kingship will be uprooted and passed to others than his own posterity. The king of the south will be strong, but one of his princes will gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion will be a great dominion. After a number of years, they will form an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south will approach the king of the north and make an agreement with him. But she won't retain her power, and he and his power won't last either. Instead, she will be surrendered along with her attendants, her father, and the one who supported her during those days. Then another root from the same branch, or Netzer, will appear in her father's place. He will attack the army of the king of the south, king of the north, enter his fortress, and succeed in conquering him. He will also carry off as booty to Egypt their gods, their cast metal images, and their valuable gold and silver vessels. Then for a number of years he will refrain from attacking the king of the north. Afterwards the king of the north will invade the kingdom of the king of the south, but he will retire to his own land. His sons will rouse themselves to muster a large army, which will advance like a flood passing through. In another campaign, they will march on the enemy's stronghold. The king of the south, enraged, will set out to do battle against the king of the north, who will in turn muster another large army. But the northern army will be defeated by their enemies and carried off. So the conqueror will grow proud and do... Oh no, the conqueror will grow proud as he slaughters many tens of thousands, but he won't prevail because the northern army will again muster an army, something like that. The northern king, king of the north, will again muster a large army, muster an army larger than the first. At the end of this period, after a number of years, it will be a large, well-supplied army. These will be days when many will resist the king of the south 
and even some of the more violent among your own people will rebel in order to fulfill their vision, but they will fail. Then the king of the north will come, set up siege works, and capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be an insufficient defense, and even his elite troops will not be able to withstand him. So the invader will do as he pleases. Will do as he pleases. Hmm. And no one will be able to withstand him? Uh, he will establish himself in the glorious land and have the power to destroy it. He will advance with the full force of his kingdom, but he will make an alliance with the king of the south and give the daughter in marriage to him. Now his object will be to destroy the king of the south, but the agreement won't last or work out in his favor. So he'll turn his attention to the coastlands and islands and capture many. But an army commander will put a stop to his outrages and make his outrages come back on him. Then he will turn his attention to the strongholds in his own land. But he will stumble and fall and not be seen again. In his place will arise one who will send out a tax collector into the glorious land, the Eretz Tazevi. But after a few yamim, or days, he will be broken, though not in anger or in battle. In his place will rise a despicable man, not entitled to inherit the majesty of the kingdom. But he will appear without warning and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Large armies will be broken and swept away before him, including the Prince of the Covenant, the Tsar Habrit. Alliances will be made with him, but he will undermine those alliances by deceit. Without warning, he will assail the most powerful men in each province and do things his predecessors never did, either recently or in the distant past. He will reward them with plunder, spoil, and great wealth while devising plots against their strongholds, but only for a time. Then he will summon his power and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will fight back. But he won't, with a very large and powerful army, but he won't prevail because of the plots devised against him. Those who, sit at, those who share his food will destroy him and his army will be swept away and many will fall in the slaughter. These two kings bent on mischief will sit at the same table speaking lies to each other, but none of this will succeed because the appointed end will not have come yet. Then the king of the north will return to his own land with great wealth and with his heart set against the covenant. He will take action and return home. And at the designated time, the king of the north will return to the south, but this time things will turn out differently than before, for ships from Kittim will come against him so that his courage will fail. In retreat, he will take furious action against the Kodesh Brit, the Holy Covenant. Armed forces will come at his order and profane the fortress and the sanctuary and set up an abomination that causes desolation. Those who act wickedly against the Kodesh Brit, he will corrupt with his blandishments. But the people who know their Elohim will stand firm and prevail. Many among the people with discernment will cause the people to understand what is happening. Though for a time, for many Yamim, they will fall victim to the sword, fire, exile, and pillage. When they stumble, they will receive a little help, though many who join them will be insincere. Even some with discernment will stumble, so that some of them may be re refined, purified, and cleansed for an end yet to come at the designated time. Then the conqueror will do as he pleases.
he will exalt himself and consider himself greater than any god. He will utter monstrous blasphemies against the Allah of gods, but he will only prosper until the period of fury is over. He will show no respect to the gods his ancestors worshipped or the god women worship. He won't respect any of them because he will consider himself greater than all of them. Instead, he will honor a god of strongholds with gold, silver, precious stones, and many other costly things. He will honor a god unknown to his ancestors. He will deal with the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign god, and he will confer honor on those he acknowledges, causing them to rule over many and distributing land as a reward. But when the time for the end comes, the king of the south will push at him, and the king of the north will attack him with, like a whirlwind, with a cavalry, no, with chariots, a cavalry, and a great navy, a large navy. They will invade many countries, overwhelm them. The king of the north will invade many countries, overwhelm them, and move on. He will even enter the Eretz Tezavi, land of glory, and many countries will come to grief. But these will be saved from his power, Edom, Moab, and the people of Ammon. He will also reach out his hand and seize other countries too. The land of Egypt will not escape. He will control the valuable gold and silver treasure, uh, treasures? of Egypt. Uh, he will, as well as everything else of value in Egypt. Yeah, I think that's right. Put and Ethiopia will be subject to him. But news from the north and east will alarm him so that he will set out in a Cheya Gibor, which means great fury to an annihilate and do away with many but when he pitches his the tents of his palace between the sea and the mountain glorious beautiful the har tezavi kodesh he will come to his end with no one to help Hey, this is Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince who champions your people, will stand up. And there will be a time of distress unparalleled from the time they became a nation until that moment. At that time, your people will be delivered. All those whose names are written in the book or sefer. Many, or rabim of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, the Admat Afir, will arise, some to everlasting life, others to everlasting shame and abhorrence. But those with discernment will shine like the brightness of heaven's dome, and those who lead many to righteousness, like the Kokhavim stars. But you, Daniel, Shut up these Derovim and seal up these words. Many will, because they have to do with days in the distant future. Many will rush here and there as knowledge or da'as increases. Then I looked up and I saw two others, one on this bank of the river and the other on its other bank. And the one of them said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the, the river, how long will these wonders last? The man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river raised his right and left hands toward heaven, Hashomayim, and swore by him who lives forever. 
that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that would be when the power of God's holy people, the Yad Am Kidoshim, is no longer being shattered, that all these things will end. I heard all this, but I did not understand it. So I asked, Adonai, what will the outcome of all these things be? And he said to me, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are to remain a secret and sealed up until the time of the end. Many will refine, purify, and cleanse themselves. For the time of the end, but the wicked will keep on acting wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those with discernment will understand that from the time the Had Tamid is taken away until the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is anyone who waits for and arrives at the 1,335 days. But you, Daniel, go your way. You will rest and rise and receive your reward at the end of days.